to this meeting of the Standards and General Purposes Committee. Um, item one is apologies for absence. Are there any apologies for absence? Yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillor Andrew Howard and Councillor McLean is uh, attending as substitute. Um, we're currently waiting for Councillor Williams, who should be with us shortly, and Councillor Cowper. Okay, uh, you're welcome, Nick. Um, item two is declarations of pecuniary interest. Are there any? Item three is the minutes of the previous meeting. Are they agreed? And just nod. Agreed. All right, thank you. Um, item four is the audited final accounts. And uh, Caroline Holland will um, introduce this and then uh, hand over to Suresh. And we've all got, also got Roger uh, ready to answer any difficult questions. Okay, Caroline. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for yeah, making it clear that Roger will be asking the, the difficult questions. I'm happy with that. So I just wanted to um, bring to your attention our audited final accounts. We've got the reports of the auditors and just one change from um, the statements that we brought to you in September. So I think we've made good progress. And also, I think um, Sharesh has said that we're going to be one of the first EY clients to have their accounts audited and certainly audited by the, the deadline that has been set by us. So I think it's sort of a tremendous um, success and achievement by both um, the external audit team and also our team with the way that we had to work um, sort of remotely and not have been able to respond directly and in the office to the normal queries that um, come through. But I think the fact that we're here tonight with just a few minor um, changes to the accounts and also then sort of the audited um, results reports that Sharesh I'm sure will take you through um, I'm just happy to answer any questions or hand straight over to Suresh to introduce his main reports. Thank you. Well, before you go on, Caroline, can I say thank you to uh, all the staff who've worked hard to achieve this? Um, and I'm sure um, Suresh will be um, informing us that uh, because we've done so well, we get a discount on uh, our, <laughs> our fee this year. That would be lovely. <laughs> Suresh, over to you. Do you want to just confirm that before you start? I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, he's, <gone> <laughs> he's playing for time. Right. Is that better? That's it. Ah. Uh -huh. You'd have thought after six months of working remotely, I'd, I'd know how to unclick the uh, the mute button. So um, apologies for that. So, so good evening, uh, Chair. Good evening to members of the committee. Um, I've I've also got a couple of colleagues here who can answer, answer the difficult questions. So I've got Simon Mathers who you know, and Simon Luck, I think you also know, who have previously presented the committee. Um, we're, we're acutely conscious that actually th this is the second time we've, we've brought this report to, to you. Um, back in September, we brought uh, the report, which reported that we were making substantial progress, but obviously hadn't concluded. We are now in a position where, um, bar the items that are listed on your page 19 in the pack, which is... Um, the seventh page of our report but that, that just gives you a status update and the two procedures we've got there are in effect procedures that we can't do until obviously we get to this position and you um you provide us with a management representation letter and we conclude on events up to the date of issuing the opinion so um after tonight we will be able to conclude those two procedures and then finalize our internal processes in order to uh, provide your opinion uh, early next week, which, as Caroline rightly says, uh, will be one of the first audit opinions that we've issued for the 1920 accounts, um, which is a recognition, I think, of all the challenges that we've, that we've that we've all faced in terms of having to work, work in the way that we've worked, but also some of the issues that we've previously reported to you around going concern, etc. So, so we're just going to focus on the changes uh, since the last report that we issued, Chair, rather than going through the whole report again. So. Uh, I just wanted to highlight on this page that you'll see in the middle there, there was reference to our consideration of potentially two emphasis and matter paragraphs in the audit report around uh, going concern, but also around uh, the property plant and equipment valuations where there was that material uncertainty reported by the valuer. Having concluded our internal consultation process, we're now satisfied actually, we don't need to include those two paragraphs in our audit report. So you'll see that reflected in the audit report that's in 
uh, the document. Um, I'm going to ask um, Simon Luck just to update you on two other aspects of the uh, report. One is on the, the pensions and the IS-19 work, and one is the, um, the dedicated schools grant and where that, that landed. And then I'll ask Simon Mathers to just take you briefly through the value for money section where we've now included the narrative reporting previously we we we, we hadn't included that and then finally i'll, I'll wrap up with uh, reference to the fees chair since you since you politely asked about that at the start so let me let me hand you over to simon luck to, to pick up those two two pieces and then, then simon Mathers will pick up the vfm and i'll conclude on fees simon thanks Rish. uh so can i just bring everyone to page 28 of the pack uh, which is the dedicated school grants. Could you turn the volume up a little, Simon? Sorry, can you hear me better? That's better, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is pay, uh, page 28 of the pack uh, in relation to dedicated school grants. So um, previously we've uh, vouched for um, the DSG uh, income and expenditure and uh, we've confirmed that uh, the cumulative DSG overspend in the year has been uh, correctly disclosed in uh, the DSG deficit without being charged to the general fund. Uh, and since our last report, a statutory uh, instrument has been uh, prepared by the MHCLG, um, which would allow cumulative DSG deficits to be accounted for as an unusable reserve. Uh, however, this uh, instrument will be uh, applied uh, prospectively uh, from uh, the 1st of April 2020 and therefore has no impact on uh, the Council's 2019-20 financial statements. So uh, next thing is uh, page 29 of the pack in relation to pensions liabilities. So we have now rece uh, received the assurances uh, requested from the uh, auditors of the pension fund, uh, which is also ourselves. And uh, following the receipts of um, that assurance, uh, an amendment has been made uh, to the financial statements to increase the pensions liabilities uh, accounted for the, uh, in the uh, authorities balance sheet to account for the difference um, between the authorities share of the pension fund assets used to inform the uh, actual um, actuarial assessment of the pension liability and the final value of the pension fund assets accounted for in the pension funds financial statements. Uh, I will hand you back to Suresh. No. Thank you. Thanks. Simon, Simon Mathers, take you through VFM, please. Thank you, Suresh. So if I could take you to page 38 of your pack, which is the section of our report that deals with reporting on a value for money conclusion. So as a starting point, um, we intend to give an unqualified conclusion on your arrangements for effectiveness of use of resources, so an unqualified VFM conclusion. We raised one significant risk, which was around the Council's arrangements for sustainable resource deployment. In order to assess that, we looked in detail on what the Council's done to address the historic budget pressures it's faced in children's schools and families, what it, how it did in terms of achievement of its saving targets in 1920, and its future financial planning to address budget gaps in the MTFS. As part of doing that, we also looked at the results of a SEND inspection that was undertaken by Ofsted in, during 1920 and the Council's response to the inspection findings, and also the Council's deficit recovery plan in respect of the cumulative DSG deficit that Simon Luck has just referred to. So in terms of budget pressures and financial performance last year, so the council did well in 1920, it delivered uh, underspend against its revenue budget that allowed it to add to reserves, which as things have turned out will be extremely useful in 2021. As part of that, it also underspent within children's schools and families. So an area that has been subject to significant cost pressure. However, within that special education needs, so SEN transport costs and other areas financed by DSG are remain very significant cost pressures for the council and indeed very significant cost pressures for many upper tier authorities. 
In terms of achievements of savings and update of the medium term financial plan. So the council didn't achieve its saving targets in 1920. It delivered 72% and that was a, a of the planned targets, which was a reduction of 78% from the prior period. The MTFS was updated in February, and at that point in time, there were budget gaps to be closed of 3.3 million, 6.9 million, and 9 million in 2021, 22, 23, and 23, 24, respectively. We don't consider the impacts of COVID-19 on the council's arrangements as part of the FM this year. And the NAO has made it very clear that we shouldn't do, given that the advent of physical restrictions on movement only occurred a year, a, a week prior to the end of the financial year. It would be unreasonable to expect the council to have factored all of that in to medium term financial planning by the 31st of March. However, the financial outlook is clearly very different because of C19 in 2021. So the council at the the time that we did the work was forecasting a full year overspend of 23.7 million if it hadn't have been for the impacts of uh, covid-19 that would have been that would have been converted to a forecast uh, full year surplus of 3.2 million so clearly there is much work to do to update financial plans and to continue to update uh, identify savings and and rethink efficiency plans because of the impact of covid-19 in terms of the SEND inspection and the council's response to it, so there were some critical points that were made in the inspection, along with some areas of good practice being highlighted. We're happy that the council has worked with a local CCG to um, develop an action plan to address the weaknesses that have been identified. And based on our review of relevant documentation, uh, those actions are in place and being for, taken forward. In terms of the DSG recovery plan, so a recovery plan is in place. It was last updated in January. And the things in there are very much focused on the areas where the council is, is facing significant uh, cost pressures. So specifically looking at expanding state, state school, uh, special school provision, rather than using more expensive independent sector care, working collaboratively with state schools, uh, in improving consistency in identifying children with special education needs and increasing the level of intervention support for uh, people in the 14 to 25 year old age cohort. So having considered all of that, we are satisfied that it is appropriate to give a unqualified VFM conclusion. However, we would say that DSG and special education needs does continue to be a real pressure point for the council. So looking forward, the council projects a DSG overspend of approximately 66 million by the end of 23-24. So it is a real area of financial pressure and along with many, many upper tier authorities, it's uh, an area that needs to be addressed. I will stop there and pass back over to Suresh. Thank you. So just finally then, I just want to take you to page 51, which is the page where we report on the audit fees. Uh, previously, we have indicated areas of additional work that would uh, warrant additional fees, and we gave you an indication of what those fees might be as part of the audit plan. As you'll see there, those three areas that we identified in planning, we've now included the final fees associated to those areas. And we've also then included additional fees in respect of the additional work that we've done around going concern, but also then the consultation processes we've had to undertake in order to make sure that we are giving you the right assurance in terms of what we say in the audit opinion itself. Um, we will provide uh, details of all those additional fee areas to the Director of Corporate Services as, as we have done in previous years in order to support um, where we are seeking those additional fees. We will stop there, Chair, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, are there any questions from members or do you want, sorry, before we do go on to that, Caroline, is there anything you'd like to say in response or are you content to go to questions? Okay. Uh, are there any questions from members? David. It's it's about DSG because I, I'm not quite clear here wearing, wearing our, our audit hat uh, as to 
where there is scrutiny, a non-cabinet um, consideration of the DSG issue. So um, I wonder if one of our officers can tell us who is who at member level, um, other than cabinet, is looking at, at DSG and DSG recovery, because our auditors are saying this is you know, really quite an important issue and it's a big sum of money. It's certainly, um, Councillor Williams, it's my understanding that the report went to Children's and Young People's Overview and Scrutiny Panel and we're waiting for an update on the um, current deficit to be able to take that back. We're also um, having a meeting with the DfE, meant to be this month, uh, that may be subject to change because of COVID having some impact on the meetings they're looking to do, to come in and um, talk to us about our recovery plan. Thank you. Any other questions from members? Adam. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, um, Suresh and Simon. Simons, I say. Um, just obviously coming on to, um, I know um, I queried this in the past, Suresh, around going concern, obviously, is such a hot topic across all entities throughout the spectrum. Um, in terms of the um, work next year, um, I obviously see that there was detailed disclosure required within the account around going concern. Is this something that we're now expected to see going forward or is this something that was just a one-off in regards to this year because of the pandemic? Um, and just two more questions whilst I'm um, on the air. Um, secondly, um, I obviously, um, note regarding the audit difference, the understatement of 6.3 million due to is the valuation between the surveyors of the council and EY. Um, is there sort of, um, is this going to be a common unadjusted difference year after year? Because obviously the assumptions the council officers surveyor will use will always be different to the EY's um, Surveyor, and finally, um, has there been any sort of um, control findings or any sort of um, feedback from your work around sort of non-compliance with any sort of laws, regulations, or any fraud that's been identified? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Three questions there. I might. I'm going to ask Simon Mathers to talk about the valuation issue. If that's all right. Um, and uh, I'll answer the last one first. So we haven't identified any control findings that have suggested any um, non-compliance with laws and regulations because we, we would have reported that if we had identified anything. In terms of the going concern disclosure, um, under the code and actually your code in terms of preparing the accounts uh, and, account, and normal accounting standards, you, you are required to make a disclosure. It's just up until now, this year, you've, you've literally just had a one-liner in line with every other local authority. Um, I suspect that disclosure will need to be maybe not as extensive as it has been this year, but definitely more extensive than the one-line that it has been up until this year. So, um, and I, I would imagine SIPA would provide some additional guidance around that as we move into uh, the 2021 financial year. So, I mean, do you want to pick up the valuation point, please? Yeah, which is a good question. So, the, we fed back the detail in the reporting of why our valuers opinion was different in uh, to the, the council's valuers. So I suppose it's whether that is considered by the council's valuers next year and whether the same valuers do the valuation. And if nothing changes, it would be something that if we looked at it again in detail, we would need to continue to report. Yes, clearly, if the feedback that we've given is considered and the approach is changed, it may not arise as a different a, a difference again, or if different valuers did the work, it may not arise as a difference again. Okay. Happy with that, Adam? Are there any other questions from members? 
Ben. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I may be, uh, you know, making Caroline's life more difficult here because I asked a similar question um, in a different scrutiny meeting uh, just this week. Um, and I, I don't mean to drone on about the DSG thing too much, but I think it's useful, especially in the context, just as this is a public meeting, just so if people are watching, I haven't read the report here, um, and it kind of links to what um, Councillor Williams was saying in terms of a clarification of why this is being considered in the audit is, and I don't know who this is to, my, my first part of the question is a clarification is the reason it's part of the audit this year is because it's considered an overspend and the, that's part of the, that would normally be part of the, the value for money. Would this, this potential statutory change of including this deficit in, from our general fund change the way the auditors look at this? Um, and then maybe my, maybe not a question at the end here, but a comment being, this is something we have to pay for. There are, ch there are children that need special needs care and service in education. Um, and it's our obligation as a council to provide that. Um, and the government isn't, well, Department for Education needs to clarify with us the support they're going to give us going forward because it's not hitting what we're having to spend on it. Um, multiple questions there. Maybe the auditors will be able to explain why it's specifically in the value for money this time, but maybe another um, time Caroline has to repeat herself to me <laughs> again this time. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I, I think that's a fair question in terms of why uh, it's a feature of, of this year's audit. I suppose two, two aspects. One, one the, the accounting angle, which uh, in pre the previous year was more of an issue because there was less um, certainty around how you should account for that. That, that changed as a result of um, SIPFA changing the guidance and you, 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 you followed that guidance. So we're, we're happy with the actual accounting treatment. And then the second element is because of the, the size of the deficit it comes under the value for money conclusion as given the significance of that deficit, what arrangements is the council put in place to mitigate as far as it can um, the, 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 the risks associated to that deficit. Um, and that's the reason why it was initially in the value for money conclusion work. That's slightly changed because again, the DFE regulations changed about how you actually um, fund the DSG deficit. Um, but the focus on the arrangements still stood given the extent of that deficit. So the, the difference, the, the difference to if we won't wound back a year, we were reporting this issue because there wasn't the clarity then that this should not be charged to the general fund. So it was it was very much then an accounting issue and the deficit was smaller. We have the, the clarity, there is the clarity now there, as Suresh says, from the SIP for guidance, that this should not be charged to the general fund. So is not a cost that the council needs to absorb. Clearly, it's a cost that somebody needs to absorb somewhere, and the council has a clear as a role, doesn't it, in terms of a, being a both a commissioner and a provider of services in the area to make sure that the spend, you know, the spend is kept as as low as it can without compromising care quality. So that's why it continues to feature in VFM. So in many ways, as the accounting issue has gone away, but the VFM issue stays there in terms of the council's enablement role. And, All right. Yes, I was going to say, Chair, and if I could just say that um, for 2018-19, that was the first year we actually went into deficit in our DSG, um, but the amount was just was a, under three million and therefore not material. And we had a slight disagreement with the auditors, just like the valuation about the way that we treated that, so that we did show that as a negative reserve. Um, but because it wasn't material, it was um, reported to you as such, but not significant enough for to either qualify the accounts or value for money. Clearly it's grown um, to just under sort of 13 million. And we know already during the course of this year, it's grown again. So I think that's why the value for money side, it's do we, what are we doing to mitigate the further increases in that? And even with the statutory override, we're meant to have a, a recovery plan over three years. So clearly that's a significant amount of money to try and recover over the three years. And that's why we're asking for the updated um, plan on the spend to come forward to us, then see what actions do we still need to take 
or can we take to be able to address this? But we're not alone um, amongst certainly the Southwest London boroughs, um, but I think it's the scale of our overspend is what's challenging um, and therefore is drawn to our attention as we do through the monitoring report and the auditors have done through the accounts and the value for money statement. Thank you. Ben, are you happy with, with that response? And, and was it better than the last time you asked Caroline? Um, I'm very happy with the response, as ever, um, lots of detail from Caroline, um, and it's always appreciated, and thank you for the auditors as well. Um, maybe a comment from me, this, I'm always asking questions about this because I'm quite frustrated about it, um, in terms of the, the imbalance, in terms of DfE giving us less money than they say, but I'm hoping there'll be constructive meetings going forward with the council about that. You don't need to apologise for asking entirely sensible questions, Ben. Are there any other questions from members? Okay, well, in that case, uh, what are we asked to do? To note? Caroline? Um, I think, sorry, I've, I've come off. Um, to agree, but also you need to sign some um, letters for us. Um, so hold if we... The, hold the paper up. <laughs> Inside the screen, that would be appreciated. Um, and and I think for the, the committee to make sure that they're comfortable um, with what we've done, but I think to note the accounts, the auditors' reports, and for you to sign the statement of responsibilities and the letter of rep. If Is that, that agreed? Chair, can I just, just quickly also, uh, men there is a pension fund um, yeah. annual audit report in there as well, which is actually pretty much the same as what it was in September, only obviously just saying we're now in a position that we conclude on that as well. But just, just for completeness, that the pension fund uh, is also ready for uh, for conclusion. OK, well, we will add that on if it's the same as we saw previously, um, other than you're saying that it's done and dusted, uh, then we'll do that. So is that agreed? Can you nod? Great. Chair? OK, that's agreed. Chair, if I may, with, with, your, with your agreement, uh, are you happy me to insert your electronic signature onto those three documents along with Caroline's signature and send off to the auditors. Would you like to sign them in person? Um, what What is actually required, Suresh? I've been yeah, having... We're, we're been okay having, with electronic signatures. We've got no requirement to have a wet signature. All right. Um, I've been having some debates recently with bankers about the requirement for... Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, God bless bankers, David, can I say. Um, <laughs> but uh, some, they told me uh, an electronic signature would do only uh, to find that some weeks later they sent it back saying they needed a wet signature. So, um, yeah, but don't, 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 don't use a Sharpie if you've been <laughs> listening to what's going on in Arizona. OK, right. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll catch up with the news. I mean, clear, that's why you were late, David. You've been watching the news. So the rest of us are here ready to go. <laughs> OK, so uh, are we agreeing uh, what has just been outlined by Caroline? Is that agreed? Great, thank you. Now, I um, owe Dagmar an apology because before the meeting, she asked uh, if item six could be taken first. And uh, as always, I'm, I'm like the runaway train. Uh, once I get into meeting mode, um, I'm getting through the agenda in a brisk and business-like manner. Um, so can we go to number six? Um, Dagmar, as you know, uh, uh, as our Director of Public Health, has been um, uh, a little busy uh, over the last few months. Um, she attended the um, health scrutiny panel uh, on Tuesday, which uh, I chaired. And um, you know, she is, uh, I'd imagine, pretty busy with uh, recent events and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. So, Dagmar, uh, over to you to Thank introduce. You. Thanks, and um, um, good evening. Thanks, um, um, Peter, for accommodating um, me early. Um, so, as Peter said, I'm, I'm Dagmar Tson, I'm the Director of Public Health. And um, the purpose of bringing um, the short paper to you is um, to ask for your approval for the terms of reference of our Health and Wellbeing Community Subgroup. And just as a quick um, reminder, um, the group is part of our governance um, structure for our outbreak control. 
and it was a requirement under the DHSC guidance um, a member led um, governance board that particularly engages the community and those um, 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 groups in our community particularly vulnerable to COVID. And we have um, um, agreed to use our health and wellbeing board and this new bespoke um, um, communities. Thank you. Uh, um, so the, yeah, Sorry. the terms of reference have been agreed by um, um, the health and wellbeing board. Just for your understanding, this is um, the subgroup is advisory and consultative will report to the statutory health and wellbeing board and it's um, asked as a fixed term until the April, of, until the end of um, March, in the hope that um, we've um, got a grip on COVID um, by then. If not, um, we will review um, um, whether we need it any longer. That's all, I think, pretty straightforward. Any questions, please um, ask me. Okay. Um, do members have any questions um, on this issue? Okay, well, can we agree uh, the terms and refer of reference? Oh, sorry, Katie. That's all right. I was a bit late because I didn't want to butt in before anyone else. I only had one very minor question about the terms of reference, which under frequency of meetings, it says the subgroup meets more frequently than the core group. But it doesn't say more than that, which doesn't feel like a very helpful <laughs> piece of information in terms of frequency. I wondered if it could be a little bit more specific. Yes, we can do that. Um, we left some flexibility in there. So the Health and Wellbeing Board meets at the moment every two months and the core group meets in between every um, month. So well, perhaps, perhaps we could say that just a little yeah. bit more specifically for people who don't know that, that background. Yeah. No worries, no worries. Are you able to make that amendment without going back to them, Dagmar? I'm sure I can. Okay, great. Thank you for that suggestion, Katie. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, well, in that case, can we approve these terms of reference? Excellent. Dagmar, um, Thank enjoy you. the rest of your evening. And my apologies for keeping you waiting longer than I, uh, you should have needed to. So, um, okay, so we're now going to go back to item five, which is the whistleblowing policy review. Margaret, you're going to introduce this. There you are, yes. I couldn't see you earlier. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a review of uh, the council's whistleblowing policy. Um, and it's a, an exercise I do every couple of years. Um, this, the review this time is included in the review of the policy, but also to look at the process that the council follows. Um, so you'll see in the attachment is an attachment with a flow chart to explain, um, to show the process that follow, is followed when we receive a, um, a concern. The changes on the whistleblown policy, um, uh, uh, just some clarity, the policy covered the main points that are meant to be covered when we looked at good practice. Um, so the items are outlined in page 118 just uh, make it a bit clearer on the different stages that um, people should follow if they need to raise a concern so they can raise it first with their line manager. It's appropriate um, and then it moves on to um, if they don't think it's been dealt with sufficiently or if they want to move to the next stage, there's like, named officers they can contact. Um, of course, that people can go straight to the um, named officers or um, other contacts are listed there, but it's just making those clear in the policy. Um, in the process within the council, we've actually set up monthly um, meetings with the monitoring officer, HR, legal and audit and fraud um, to make sure that we consider each case as it comes in um, and then um, review them on a, a regular basis so that they're actually pro um, progressing. Um, so that's uh, changed since the last um, policy review. Um, um, the rest of the report's just explaining how we um, have compared with areas of good practice um, in relation to how we record, investigate and communicate our policy. The only other point I was gonna just mention was on the training. Um, we do provide training to employees on online for training and that's gonna be refreshed um, by the end of the financial year. So that'll be rolled out again to all employees um, and that covers whistleblowing as well. Um, 
if anyone's got any questions on the report, happy to answer those. Do members have any questions? David. And I'm I'm sort of slightly apologetic that the the question is not really on the whistleblowing policy, but it's it's on the report. And you do actually at um, page one one seven, uh, paragraph three eight, uh, where you're sort of illustrating uh, the reports. But you nevertheless give us some figures there that um, are up to date um, and which don't appear anywhere else on this report. So if I may, um, the table there at the top of page 117, the number of fraud cases, a um, bit, bit alarmed to see that uh, in 2021, in the six months or so to October, seven months maybe, there are as many cases uh, reported as there were in 2019-20. Um, can you give a comment on that? Margaret? Yeah, um, sorry, uh, my uh, my internet keeps saying it's in, um, unstable, but um, I think I got I got the gist of the question was to explain why the number of cases is similar to last year. Um, so my internet was breaking up. If I've missed any point, any, any other point, um, that, that is we did primarily, have ten I'm cases just in progress, so then they would roll over into the following. I'm really sorry, my um. Can you I don't repeat know if I could, that, Margaret? Could, could I ask? Um, sorry. Can you repeat that last remark? You said something um, about things rolling forward. Uh, there, there was ten cases in. There was we had ten cases in progress at the end of last year, so they've been one. They would roll forward into this year, so they would be part of the. Uh, number and then we've got a few that have been um sitting um waiting for prosecution that's got held up have been delayed because the court Margaret, that, would happen, that would happen every year you'd have some rolling forward wouldn't you so yeah. you shouldn't have that there must be an explanation for the increase um i don't uh well i mean the I don't know what the explanation is for an increase. It's just cases that we get referred to us that we would log. Um, I'd say at Merton, it's got a good, I, we get a lot of referrals through our um, audit action email, which is working really well. Um, and so I think it's good that we're still getting um, referrals, even in the uh, current situation, that there is still ways to contact us because um, before we'd get them in the post or we'd get written um, referrals. So, um, yeah. Um, Carol, can you shed any light on this? I suppose well, I was just sort of picking up on what Margaret was saying there about an increase in number of referrals. But if you see the no further action has actually increased to seven cases out of that 18. So don't forget some of these are coming forward and some may be genuine, but some may not be genuine and could be um if there's grievances going on it could be sort of staff maliciousness so there's elements of that to take into account so i think whilst there may be an increase overall the fact that there's also been an increase in no further action which could imply that therefore no fraud was found um i think is something to take some comfort from but it maybe we'll have a look at some of the cases and give some feedback and an update to the um next meeting in march if that's helpful councillor OK, uh, David, you want to come back. But one, one question that occurred to me is if there's an increase, should that be seen as a negative or a positive? Because it could be that people are more inclined to blow the whistle uh, on things that we need to know about. Um, or on the other hand, it could be that there's um, the same proportion being reported. There's just more of it. David, you have a question. Well, um... I'm, I'm happy enough to, to, to wait, to, and March seems a long way off, but so does the, so does the 3rd of December at the moment. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to wait for that. Um, what I suppose had gone through the back of my mind, and, and it might be completely wrong, is uh, whether the increase was in any way connected with 
um, a huge increase in working from home um, and therefore sort of lack of, of potential supervision. I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's something that could be addressed when we, when we look, at, um, look at this again in March. Well, my understanding is that there are all sorts of um, ways of monitoring uh, what people are doing uh, when they're uh, working from home. Um, but Caroline, you may, may want to respond to that. Um, I would say not necessarily due to people working from home. Um, but we, I need more detail on the cases to be able to verify that. So we will look. And if there is anything definitely within that, we'll wait until March to bring you back some information, because clearly with the continuation of people working from home, that was something we would need to address sooner. So we'll have a look. And if there's anything in that, we'll come back to you sooner. OK. And one, one question I've sorry, um, John, you wanted to raise a question. You're not. I can't hear you. I just want to raise a question about the appeal process. It says here on page 115 that the appeal process, there's no need for an appeal process, has been removed because of certain amendments. Surely you sometimes have malicious That's complaints. Right, um, how, how, you deal, how do you deal with that if people want to appeal against it? There is a process to go outside the council if they're not happy. Um, and there is contacts we've provided, so they can go to, um, if they're not happy with the way the council's dealt with it, there is a process anyway to go externally, so it doesn't really need um, an appeal process in there internally. It would be reviewed again if it needed to be. So what you're saying is, if somebody's not happy, they have access to an independent person outside the authority, and that's the route that uh, would be taken. Yeah. And that's yeah. common practice, that's good uh, practice um, uh, on how these are dealt with. Okay. John, are you happy with that? Well, that would make it more difficult for them, wouldn't they, going outside rather than having it done internally? Well, it might be more, it might be easier because if it's easier. it might be easier if there's somebody that uh, is um, intimidating uh, uh, somebody, uh, then it might be easier for them to go and speak to some to a stranger. Oh. Okay. 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 My question was, and it's one that I've raised um, elsewhere, but um, I'm, I'm aware that sometimes there's whistleblowing goes on um, that results in investigations of staff uh, in terms of their, uh, not fraud, but other issues. Uh, and uh, I've asked this question before, uh, where do we get reports of staff who have been, um, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, reach, uh, with whom we have reached a compromise agreement uh, for them to leave our employment? Um, where, where does that, where would that be reported, Caroline? So within the accounts, there is a section which says the number of redundancies or number of um, leavers um, who have had redundancy pay. So it would be picked up under the other, um, the other than redundancies. Um, and we have looked previously and reported back that there have been no one who was deemed to be a whistleblower and who has um, entered into a compromise agreement. Now, what I'm talking about is a, a whistleblower makes an allegation it's investigated and the person who's the subject of that allegation leaves uh, 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 un, under a compromise agreement. Is there, is there anywhere that we could see whether such things are going on? And if but so, where? It, that would still be in that same section of the accounts because yeah. if it's the person who is, was investigated, um, they would be subject to redundancy pay still um, or a payment towards that that would be picked up in that section of the accounts there. Okay, and it's just under other? Yes, there's, there's very few under other. If you um, give me a chance, I'll come back to you to let you know how many there were in 2019-20. I'd, I'd be very interested in that. 
please. Uh, Chair, um, also I've done a check. I've got a list of all the ones that had settlement agreements from legal, and I have checked it to the uh, whistleblower register uh, recently, and I didn't find any matches on names. And we have done that previously. Um, um, well, I, I actually think that would be a, a, a good thing because uh, what I'm driving at, as I'm sure people have, have, have realised, is that instead of resolving the issue, sometimes people take the easy route and persuade somebody to, to go. Um, but if they've done wrong, it seems to me that there should be a proper investigation uh, and um, you know, the appropriate action taken, subject to all the uh, requirements of, of fair practice in employment law. Okay, made my point. Um, are there any other questions on this item? Yes, can I raise uh, a point, uh, Chair? Clive Douglas speaking. Um, can't, can't see you, Clive. Uh, I'm up on the. Oh, yes, yeah, got you, got you, got you. Yep. Thank yep. you. Um, uh, you mentioned, and, and maybe you were answering slightly on the hoof about independent persons uh, in, t in context of the whistleblowing pr uh, procedure uh, that uh, complaints would go to independent persons outside the independent persons uh, appointed by Merton Council. Uh, is it, uh, would you consider us to, and we are, it seems to me we are, Katie Willison and I are either independent persons or we're not. So I'm not, I don't quite understand the rationale for get, get, uh, wanting to go to external independent persons when you have two perfectly independent persons already in place. And given that we don't have a lot of work to do in any event, uh, perhaps it might be uh, you might want to give consideration or it might consideration might be given to the idea of expanding our role to uh, extend into whistleblowing procedure um, unless there's some particular reason you feel that uh, external independent persons are more independent than the Merton's independent persons. Well I'm not sure it's my uh, my choice where we send these things uh, but Caroline would you like to respond to that? Um, are these people with expertise in particular types of... Uh, so sort section of 11 of the report refers to the Comptroller and Auditor General are external auditors. But my understanding, um, and I think Louise may come in here to, to help, is that you investigate councillors and complaints against councillors. It is right, that's right. Staff. So that, that, that's right. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's right. I'm, I, I'm suggesting... Uh, that uh, consideration might be given to extending our terms of reference to give us actually something to do uh, because we don't actually have many we're going to hear if we have any complaints against members but uh, in the time I've been an independent uh, person for Merton I've had one complaint only and I'm uh, suggesting there might be some slack that could be taken up in this uh, role but um, Katie, I see what's going to add in and Louise may want to comment. Thanks, Katie. I, I think I'm very conscious that I was recruited to do a, to do a job uh, by councillors who interviewed me, which was around the code of conduct and uh, complaints against councillors, which I felt from my background very well able to do. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the nature of some of these uh, independent assessments are. I'm certainly not saying it would be impossible for me to do it, uh, but I do wonder whether, uh, bearing in mind that these are presumably cases at times where there's a bit of she said, he said, um, and employment dispute nature, um, that while I have done some staff grievance type nature, I haven't done this kind of work. So I think it would require a little bit of thinking through around what it is you're after, whether you have a problem with the people who are doing it at the moment and whether Clive and I are the best people, you know, to, to take on that role before I could say, yes, this is something that I think this is it's a splendid idea and I should take on. Louise, do you want to enlighten us? Yeah, yes, I was um, just to echo what Katie said, Clive and Katie are appointed under the, the standards regime for members in the Localism Act. Uh, 2011 the, the, the reason for us trying to tighten up the whistleblowing policy is, as Margaret has described by having me involved and HR and audit and the fraud partnership is to make sure that when we do get an allegation it is independently investigated within the council uh, and not just dealt with in an individual department where the allegation may have arisen so 
So I think that's why the rationale is that once that's happened, uh, we don't then want another investigation connected with the council. If the whistleblower is unhappy with the um, rigour with which we've investigated something, then that is a refer it to someone else outside the council to to consider whether to open another investigation or not. So it, I, I think it would feel a bit du it would duplicate matters to have our own independent people getting involved in that in that kind of um, second look at what we what we do as officers. Well, who are the so, people that, that do this second look then? Well, do they it have would be. It, so, so the option, sorry, sorry, as Caroline said, the options are either to go to the, the controller and auditor general at the um, National Audit Office and that they're named in the Act as someone to whom a, a reference can be made, or indeed to, to our colleagues we've heard from earlier on this evening at Ernst & Young as our external auditors. Um, so th these, these would be primarily finance matters, um, fraud, that sort of thing that you're talking about. Absolutely. And if, if, if it was about uh, the way in which a member of staff had been treated, then it would follow the HR processes. And of course, their, their remedy is then to go to the employment tribunal if they're unhappy with the way in which they've been dealt with as a result of either making an allegation or having an allegation made against them. Clive, does that answer your point? Well, I, I think I probably have a more general uh, point, which is possibly not appropriate to air here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, which, which, which is about uh, the role of the independent persons. Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, it, it seems it is restricted for various, limited for various reasons. Uh, but well, in the time I, I've been here, I, I, as I mentioned, I've been involved in one complaint only, and I'm feeling substantially underused. Uh, and uh, uh, Louise and certain councillors uh, on, on here tonight, Councillor Williams, for instance, was was, was uh, hearing me talk uh, on a discussion about the review of the Constitution on Monday, uh, where I, I was expressing similar views about the uh, lack of involvement, the lack of being used, and although interest was uh, was expressed, yes, it might be used by some. It might be useful to have an independent person give a view on that. Uh, with respect, there was no background uh, about uh, the, the particular ways. You know, it was impossible, I think, inappropriate for me to give comment there because I just had not been informed about, for instance, in that discussion, the role of scrutiny and overview committees. So I, I can't express a view viva voce, you know, ad lib a, a view. Um, so I, I'm raising quite a general question about the role of the independent person at a council like Merton, where actually you don't have many complaints. Um, and uh, Katie, of course, may come from a different background. Uh, I'm expressing the view, and I'm sorry doing it in this, this live audience, uh, that I think I could be of much more use, uh, that, and, my, and my, my skills are not being used or uh, tapped. I'm happy to sit in these meetings, but really I have very little to say or contribute. Uh, and I'm suggesting that uh, uh, consideration be given to independent persons to Merton Council having a, a greater role in consideration being given to the uh, skills and attributes of the independent persons to see if they could be used more appropriately. Otherwise, you'll see, likely to see, talking for myself, a, a tail off of interest. Okay. Well, I think, uh, I mean, you mentioned that uh, we don't want to continue this uh, in this forum, but could I suggest that perhaps uh, Louise and yourself have a conversation uh, and uh, explore uh, the options uh, and possibilities uh, um, outside this meeting. Thank you. Okay. Caroline. I just wanted to say for those of you who have access to our accounts, note 29 details officer enumeration and the number of compulsory redundancies and number of other departures. Other departures can mean voluntary redundancies, um, as well as other reasons why people leave. So in 2018-19, we had seven such people leave the organisation. And in 2019-20, we had 13 out of a total of 57. OK, thank you. What page is that on? So that is page 86 of our final accounts, okay. which are on the website. OK. Thank you. Um, so, uh, 
are we done with uh, the uh, whistleblowing policy review? Uh, are there any other questions or points that people want to make? No? Final question from me, Chair. Throughout this report, I don't see any mention of the unions. Have they got a part to play in all of this to support the accused? Yes, Chair, absolutely. And this policy is really about how an investigation gets triggered and what the person, person blowing the whistle can expect from the organisation having done so. If, if, if an allegation leads to a disciplinary investigation against a member of staff, then the council's disciplinary policies apply. And as you'd absolutely expect, they're entitled to representation and assistance from the union if they, if they are, are subject to investigation, which leads to whether or not that leads to formal disciplinary proceedings or not. But this is really sort of looking at it from the other end of the telescope. So what happens if someone wants to blow the whistle and what support they get in, in exercising that, that role? But they're mentioned on page 125, the trade unions. 125, okay, thank you. Thank one. you. Okay, so we are asked to comment upon uh, and approve the whistleblowing policy. Um, I think we've had some comments. Um, can we approve the policy? Yes, Thank you. Approve. Thank you. Okay. Um, item seven is next, the annual gifts and hospitality report. Uh, is that Lu Louise? Yes. That, that is me. Yes, thank you, Chair. Now, this is a report I hope you're well used to receiving annually. Uh, it sets out um, the declarations of gifts and hospitality that colleague members have made over the last year since the report was brought in November 2019. And also those declarations that have been made by members of staff. Um, neither of the registers show anything very startling. It appears people are registering appropriately and there are no gifts in there I think that would cause any particular eyebrows to be raised. Um, there have in the past particularly in relation to staff been more declarations uh, it's impossible to know I suppose whether or not um, the register is a bit lighter because there have been fewer gifts offered or because people have forgotten to declare them um, hence the uh, recommendation that both members and officers are uh, reminded again of the need to declare uh, gifts and hospitality when they receive them and this year is, is notable I think for the presence of the of the Wimbledon towels um, that have been given both to staff and to a number of, uh, of members uh, and in respect of whom we're seeking a, a blanket declaration for officers rather than require each uh, officer to submit an individual return so it's simply to note uh, and to to agree that we can keep on as we already do reminding people they should declare when they're offered and it, or indeed they and even if they decline uh, where gifts are worth more than 25 pounds so i'll stop there chair i'm happy to answer any questions are there any questions nope. david you're, you're always good for, question, you're chair. always good for a question on this item i didn't i haven't yeah. cleared my wimbledon towels hey, yet john, when I, john do, I've do you think i'm going to get arrested or something John, I've just asked David to speak. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, David. Well, don't worry. Uh, the police are just coming to get you, John. Yeah. Um, the um, <laughs> uh, well, not really a, a question to, to do. Is I, I was going to make a comment, and it, it's sort of slightly humorous and, and slightly serious at the same time. I mean, you, we did. Ra I raised. Um, the, the leader's um, propensity, uh, even as a supporter of um, Fulham Football Club, uh, to accept hospitality um, there. And uh, you were going to have a word with him. Uh, and, and clearly, um, you've done the trick because there's no mention of Fulham Football Club uh, at all. Um, uh, I was uh, intrigued that uh, we were all offered two towels and he got 12. Um, I'm sure we can make something of that. Um, <laughs> But it, it, there is still, with Council Alan Brittis, um, terrapin, uh, ter terrapin uh, communications. Um, and I just think, and it's, this is something for all of us, really, I, that we need to, need to think quite hard about if we take hospitality from the same firm, because the Fulham Football Club tickets used to come from Terrapin, year in and year out, 
Um, and especially if you're an office holder, there has to be um, a, either a reason for it or, or, you know, perhaps the time comes where you say, really, I just can't keep taking this hospitality um, you know, without a really good explanation. But I, so I, I'm, not, I'm not making a point against Councillor Ian Brittis particularly especially as he's about to move on. And, and I'm sure you, you will not hesitate to um, uh, keep um, uh, Chairman, you will, you will keep Councillor Allison at, at, at heel. But um, I, I just think as members, we need to really, really think hard about taking repeated hospitality from commercial entities. Okay, well, um, I mean, it, it strikes me that uh, that if Terrapin uh, extended hospitality to Fulham and then they've extended a different hospitality, it's not the same hospitality, it's just the same um, source. Um, and, and you're right, David. Yes, I did, uh, in my role as Chair of Standards, uh, have a word with my ward colleague. Uh, and it's good to see that uh, there, are, there is some uh, evidence of a successful outcome. Um, and uh, uh, I can I can do so again and draw his attention uh, to this remark, uh, but there may not. Um, and certainly, when it comes to um, uh, any future leader, uh, we will we will exercise the same scrutiny uh, of their uh, gifts and hospitality, and and that's a role for this committee. Any other questions or comments, John? You wanted to. Um, uh, fess up and, and throw yourself upon the mercy uh, of the Standards Committee. Is that right? Sorry, you're muted. I think I'll have to declare my um, women and towels tomorrow to avoid yeah. being arrested. Okay, well, you don't want to come up before David at uh, Wimbledon Magistrates Court, do you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly told you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, well then, I think we're just asked, asked to note this report. So uh, we note this report. Um, uh, and uh, item eight is complaints against members. Uh, Clive was telling us that uh, there aren't enough um, and so uh, uh, Louise may surprise us now by telling us that she's received uh, two dozen in the last week and that Clive is going to be rushed off his feet. I'm sorry, can I, can I correct you, Chairman? I didn't say there weren't enough. Uh, it's great, there are, not an, there are very few complaints. I'm saying, though, that as an independent person, uh, given that there are so few complaints, and uh, uh, it would be uh, consideration might be given to in, in, enlarging our role. That was a different point. My apologies. Louise, are there any to report? Uh, there, there have been no complaints that have made it to the investigation stage. Um, there was a complaint uh, a, a few weeks ago uh, from a resident who was unhappy with, with the content of um, some members' submissions to the Boundary Commission as part of the Boundary Review which um, having taken the advice of, of Katie as one of the independent people, I mean, we took the view that it didn't come anywhere near the threshold for requiring an investigation. It's just difference of opinion uh, about what the right thing to do about the boundaries were. Um, as, I, as I speak, um, I've just noticed in my inbox, I have got a, a complaint come in. I haven't opened it yet, so I can't update you on it. If it needs to go any further, I'll report it to the next meeting. Okay. Um... Any questions to Louise on, on this issue? Okay, item nine is the work program, uh, which is on page 161 to 162. I think our job is to uh, note that, or if there are any questions uh, or comments, then happy to take them. Okay, well, in that case, I'd like to thank you all for attending this meeting. 
uh, and making your contributions uh, and uh, thank the officers uh, for uh, their attendance. And uh, I mean, it, it wasn't just Dagmar uh, that I've seen twice this week. Um, so, um, you know, we, we are grateful to officers for um, their evenings as well as their days spent uh, working on behalf of the council. Um, 